Hello everybody, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. In video E here of the brain, we will continue our discussion of the cerebrum still with a focus on the nuclei that we find deep within the white matter of the cerebrum. We can refer to these nuclei better as subcortical nuclei. And there are two sets. We have those that include the amygdala and the hippocampi. And then we have the so-called basal nuclei. Many of these nuclei are the primary location for the production of acetylcholine and help to modulate cortex activity. So if we take a look at the picture near the top, we can definitely already easily see the amygdala and the location of the hippocampus. Now the reason why I say amygdala and hippocampi here within the text is because of course there is one of each. There is an amygdalus, or I'm sorry, amygdala nucleus in each cerebral hemisphere. And there's a hippocampus nucleus in each cerebral hemisphere. To really point to the amygdala and the hippocampus can be quite difficult because we have to literally peel apart that temporal lobe and then peek in the brain. So we can describe their location as uh, medial to the temporal lobes or on the medial aspect of the temporal lobes even though they're really part of the frontal lobes, right? They're really sitting at that junction there. These are structures that are very, very important in the formation of memory. And they're also really important in our emotional brain. Remember, we refer to that as the limbic system. Uh, if you think about this already, many of our memories are built based on emotional experiences. So let's start with the two nuclei that form the amygdala. They are given the name amygdala because they are the shape of an almond. That's what amygdala means. So again, we see one of them right here in that light purple. Or here in this frontal section, we see it located right here. The amygdala nuclei play an important role in long-term memory formation and in many of our emotional responses such as anger and fear and, and, and upset, things like that. But at the same time, they also play a role in decision-making, therefore. Now, lots of research has also noticed that we depend on the nuclei, the amygdala nuclei for interacting with other people. They, these structures are impacted and, and um, affected when people are diagnosed with post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome, which is what PTSD stands for, or anxiety and fear. Um, there's even a difference in the shape of the amygdala in people with different sexual orientations. And we also see differences in the amygdala in people who are extremely aggressive or who suffer from alcoholism. The hippocampi are capable of converting short-term memory to long-term memory. And this is really important um, because the first structure to be damaged in people who suffer from Alzheimer's is the hippocampus. And if any of you are familiar with any of the symptoms of patients with Alzheimer's disease is that indeed they're starting to have problems with um, long-term memory. It also plays a role in spatial navigation and it gets its name hippocampus because it kind of looks like a little seahorse. So it's located here in the frontal lobe, very, very inferior portion of the frontal lobe. And if we look at its full size more three-dimensionally, it has, we can sort of see um, its, its lengthier appearance. 
if we could isolate it, and I don't, you could probably look up a picture that shows better that it more or less looks like a little seahorse. In addition to the amygdalae and the hippocampi, we have nuclei that we collectively refer to as the basal nuclei. Now, very often, you will hear them being referred to as the basal ganglia. Now, this is, in theory, incorrect, right? Because you have learned that ganglia are collections of cell bodies outside of the CNS. But historically, this term, basal ganglia, has been used so much that even currently in anatomy, we are uh, accepting this, this, this name. So whether you refer to these guys as the basal ganglia or the basal nuclei, that is just fine. Now, these basal nuclei, let's first take a look at where they're located. So here we're looking at a... Once again, a frontal or coronal section of the brain. We've looked at this before. So here is one hemisphere and here is another hemisphere. So this right here is your longitudinal fissure, right? And we have our cerebral cortex here that's made up of gray matter. And here we have all of our white matter with all of those uh, projection fibers, association fibers and commissures. Now, deep within that white matter, you see these various shades of blue, right? And those are your basal nuclei. By the way, these reddish ones right here are going to be your amygdala nuclei. If we go too deep into the brain, careful, mentioned this before, we're already hitting the ventricles, which are going to be surrounding a deeper part of the brain that is called the diencephalon. So that is too far. We need to stay in the cerebrum to see the basal nuclei. So we have three sets of basal nuclei, or three pairs of basal nuclei. So let's point them out. So we have here the one that sits the closest to the ventricles, the caudate nuclei. And they're called that because cauda means tail. If we were to look at these caudate nuclei, they would kind of look, look like this. If we looked at them sideways, I should say. So they kind of look like that, kind of like a tail. And then the other two pairs kind of hang out together. We have the putamen and we have the globus pallidus, which literally means the lighter colored blob almost, not quite, but globe really, okay? In between your caudate nuclei and the other two, projection fibers run, those pyramids run to form that internal capsule, okay? Also, we're going to refer to groups of these or pairs of these basal nuclei. For instance, we refer to the caudate and putamen collectively. Let me use a different color. So the putamen and the caudate collectively, we refer to as the corpus striatum. And that is because all of these projection fibers that are coming down are not only just making that internal capsule, but they run through the putamen and the caudate and make them look somewhat striped. And so from there, the term corpus striatum. On the other hand, if we just focused on the putamen and the globus pallidus, um, Allow me to fix something here for a moment. So I used the bright red for the corpus striatum. So maybe that color coding will help you a little bit, right? CS for corpus striatum right here. If we now use bright green to indicate, indicate the lentiform nucleus, which means lens shaped or lenticular nuclei, which include the putamen, the globus pallidus, then we would have to grab these two. So here's the putamen, and here's the globus pallidus. 
So they together, if we were to look at them uh, laterally, they would look like a big lens, more or less. And so we call that the lentiform nucleus. Now these basal nuclei or these basal ganglia, they sit very deep within that white matter of the cerebrum. It's very difficult to study them. So at many levels, they're not very well understood at all. But we do know that many of their functions overlap with those of the cerebellum and that they work in association with pretty much all other parts of the brain, particularly the cortex of the cerebrum, the parts of the diencephalon, and the most superior part of the brain stem. They're involved in regulating attention and cognition, and then they play an important role in making sure that our skeletal muscles, when they contract, that, that those contractions happen rather smoothly. So with the help of the basal nuclei, information that enters into our cerebral cortex from our muscles, from our eyes, from, from what we hear, all of the sensory information needs to be processed such that we know, for instance, where to take our next step or where to grab the object with our hands. So there's a lot of comparing and, and controlling and regulating of cortical um, information. And that information is then sent to the motor and premotor cortex so that we can um, execute our movements smoothly and we can also execute them at the right time. All of, this, all of these checks and balances in the basal nuclei are also going to prevent that we create movements that we really shouldn't be creating and movements that will prevent um, certain movements to be occurring effectively. For instance, you guys know where your biceps brachii is located, right? On, your, on the anterior surface of your humerus. Well, on the posterior surface, you have the triceps brachii. The biceps brachii you do to you use when you do curls and you bring your forearm to your humerus, correct? So that's what the biceps does. When it contracts, it flexes your forearm. Now, what do you do in order to you extend your forearm and to put down the weights back on the table? Then you contract the triceps brachii. So the biceps brachii contracts to do the curl and at this point in time, it's important for that triceps brachii to relax and vice versa for when we want to put the weights down. So we say that these muscles are antagonists to one another. They work opposite to one another. It wouldn't work very well if we wanted to do a curl, meaning flexing our forearm and both the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii contract. We wouldn't be able to move that weight at all. Finally, we see that the basal nuclei play an important role in regulating how, how intensely and how fast or slow we go through stereotype movements. An example of a stereotype movement is, is um, what we do when we, when we walk, we kind of swing our arms and it's important that they're not swung too much and not too little to promote a good pace in walking and to make sure that we are not falling all over the place either. So your basal nuclei play a role in controlling balance. Balance is a big function of our cerebellum as well. So let's take a look one more time at a more realistic frontal section of the brain. So here we have the gray matter of the cerebral cortex with the longitudinal fissure here. Um, and here we have our lateral sulcus on either side. Here they call it the lateral fissure, but it really should be called um, sulcus. This dark region 
as well as this very dark region looks dark because it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So let's use blue to indicate that. So those are your ventricles. And that's way too deep into the brain for us to be identifying basal nuclei, right? But hugging these ventricles, we do see some of our uh, basal nuclei. So hugging these ventricles we see right here on either side our tail looking like caudate nuclei. Let me not use a pen, let me point to this. So the caudate nuclei are right here. And then we have both parts of our so-called lenticular or lentiform nucleus. Remember that's made up of the globus pallidus and the putamen nucleus. And then running in between the lentiform nucleus and the caudate nucleus, we have the internal capsule. So right here is the internal capsule. And we see the striped appearance here of the putamen, not so obvious for the caudate nucleus, but these two collectively are referred to as the corpus striatum. Finally, we also see here the amygdala nuclei. Sometimes they're called amygdaloid nuclei. We can't really see the hippocampi very well. They would have to, we would have to cut another slice uh, to be able to see those well. So we're Finally done discussing the cerebrum. Phew, that took several videos. So now we're ready to move on to the diencephalon.